Um, Ice Cream Hero wants to know, what is your favorite Homer injury? You got one or two that stick out? Well, I mean, him falling down Springfield Gorge is always funny just because the animation is so crazy. You think um, they took that from? Do you remember? You remember seeing the movie? Oh, what was it? Um, Black Sheep. I always get him and Tommy Boy mixed up. It's Black Sheep, I think. Yes, Black Sheep. Uh, Chris Farley, David Spade, um, Gary Busey. So Chris Farley is trying to get internet signal on his on his cell phone. This back on cell phones, um, and he. No, it's fucking Tommy Boy. So he's trying to get the cell reception, and he's at the top of a mountain. I've actually seen Tommy Boy, yeah. Yeah, so he falls down the mountain, or he falls down the hill, and he's trying. He grabs onto the little tree. I don't know why. I think it's because I saw I saw Tommy Boy before. I saw that episode of The Simpsons where Bart, you know, he saves Bart from from skateboarding down, and he falls down the gorge. Um, but do you think that's where Tommy Boy got that scene from? Because I believe The Simpsons that episode was out before Tommy Boy. Yeah, it was. Uh, maybe. Maybe yeah. that would make sense. I mean, heavy set guy falling down a hill is hard to beat. It really is, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the, and the, yeah, Homer's injuries is funny because it's been so many, but it's just like, you know, and the Homer lines too, like just lines that just, you just, the one where he, the, the, the one that my wife and I always laugh at, and we keep thinking about just, I know this isn't the question, but Homer lines is that one where Lisa's, I think this is when Homer's mom comes back for the first time and she's singing the song, you know, he comes in and she's singing the song with uh, Homer's mom. You know, how many roads must a man go down before he becomes a man or whatever. And Homer walks in right as they, they do that and he goes, I think he says six, he goes six. And they're like, and Lisa says, dad, dad. Yeah, that's a rhetorical question. And he goes, rhetorical, eh? seven or he goes to reverse seven to six like he doesn't know and she goes do you even know what rhetorical means he goes do i know what rhetorical means it was just hysterical it's like he, he gives a rhetorical question <laughs> it's just funny hey guys it's your host julian this week i sit down with longtime simpsons director tim bailey tim walks us through his early days of working on the simpsons how he went from boarding to directing the cool folks he's met along the way and some of his favorite episodes one of his favorite episodes includes the Stranger Things Meet Simpsons mashup they did for their Treehouse of Horror. I hope you guys enjoy the show. Tim, man, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Uh, it, it's a blast, man. Sean Cashman actually recommended you. So Sean was a previous guest. Sean was a fantastic guest. So Sean, thanks for setting this up. Um, before we get into your uh, into your past and background that sounds a little dark and ominous more than i meant it to be uh you got any fun stories with uh working with sean because he pointed you guys you and mark kirkland out real quick real fast he's like these are the two guys you got to have on with the animation recommendation so you got any fun sean cashman stories that we can talk about before we get mm -hmm. to the great tim bailey maybe two i mean i i just remember when he worked um earlier on the simpsons when he was doing uh character layout animation his his cubicle was pretty bare he didn't have a lot of stuff in it like he didn't have tons of toys or tons of stuff like most of animators would have but he had one strip of like printed film like of like nine or so images mm -hmm. in a row and it was just kirk from the wrath of khan doing the con thing just that crazy face of shatner doing the con thing and he had that he never I think he made it here and had a mirror, but he just had that like attached to his one of his the wings of his desk, which always made me laugh. <laughs> that part always made me laugh. <laughs> but he was on, and then he went to King of the Hill um, shortly after he went to King of the Hill to direct, which was just upstairs from us. It was in the that, same building. It's so crazy because when I talked to him, I also had Phil Roman on, the legendary Phil Roman, which was yeah. a phenomenal guest. When you sit there and you listen, to the man that helped bring the Grinch mm -hmm. to life with Chuck Jones. And then he goes over and does a bunch of the Peanuts, uh, Peanuts specials, uh, Bill Melendez. And then he's doing The Simpsons. And then Mike Judge rolls out probably my favorite adult cartoon. I'm sorry. I know you work on The Simpsons, but The King of the Hill, it, I wasn't allowed. To, I told Brad this. I wasn't allowed to watch The Simpsons when I was growing up. My uh -huh. mom, quote, unquote. Oh man, there was two, two or three shows I wasn't allowed to watch. Two of them she was vehemently, 
very, very serious about not watching King of the, not King of the, excuse me, the Simpsons. I was a Freudian slip. I think uh, the Simpsons, because she quote unquote would not have a son like that goddamn Bart Simpson. Um, right. And the other one was the Rugrats because she would not have a son or a daughter like that goddamn Angelica pickles. Right. So I'd have to sneak around and watch those two shows. And when we were, before we hit record, man, you had told me you gotten to work on the pilot of King of the Hill. What was yeah. that like, man? Mm, it was kind of like briefly, because when that happened, when they were going to do King of the Hill, they had taken some people from The Simpsons to go work on it. So mm. um, one of the guys, Phil Hayes, who was a background layout artist, at the time I was doing background, which is how I started in the show. And they brought Phil up to do King of the Hill um, to get it started. And he... Um, I think he had another another artist from The Simpsons, another background artist, do some work that didn't quite work out. Whole mm -hmm. stack of stuff, and he brought me up, and he's like, "Can you like redo this stuff?" And I remember, I remember Hank's truck, that Ford Ranger I had at the time, the Ford Ranger. And I can't remember if it was I put that in his, his truck or, but I remember like Phil's we'll saying, "We need a truck." Yeah, I think maybe yeah. I I came up with it at that point because I was just had that truck, just out of necessity, but. Um, it was just for one or I think it was the pilot, um, maybe one other episode that I helped him on. And then just went back downstairs to the Simpsons. That's still pretty cool, man. Anytime I can talk, even if it's just a few seconds, few moments, King of the Hill, like I said, King, King of the Hill. Hill, such like there's there's a couple lines that I quote. And did you ever did you ever watch King of the Hill or were you just super, not, super? Not too much. I do remember Don't Feed the Beast, which always made me laugh that line. <laughs> with dale saying don't feed the beast but yeah i watched it from time to time my favorite line and it's it's just whenever i hear my wife ask me hey can you grab my purse and i said that's my purse i don't know you and it's bobby hill when he's taking the women's self-defense class and he's just kicking everybody in the groin so there's so many lines that i quote from that one pocket sand rusty shackleford all this crazy shit that i've just like I said, I was very malleable, like most kids are at such a young age, you know, 12, 13, 14, watching that one. I remember the the animation domination block. So it would start with The Simpsons and then it would go to the King of Hill from the previous week when it was the new season. And then it would go Family Guy, American Dad, I believe at that time. Um, and then something else, maybe Bob's Burgers at that time was, was, was kicking around when I was watching. So I, I can't remember if Bob's Burgers was out just yet, but I know for sure. Might have been those early four. for that. Yeah, it might have been early yeah. for that. Yeah, There's but those, a show called The Downtowners. Was that on? Oh, that was on WB. That was another one that was in our, The Downtowners was in mm -hmm. our. Um, Your block. I have blo well, it was another, uh, it was another film Roman production in that, in that original building that we were in. Mm -hmm. It's hard to remember. Like nowadays people will say like, depending on how long you've worked in The Simpsons, they'll say like, oh, is that in the old building? And some people say like the old, old building. <laughs> or they go the old, old old building because the i worked in three buildings but there was the original building mm -hmm. right the, the Klasky building but the north hollywood building was the one i started in and that was like season i don't know when they went over that was the first one they went over from Klasky. um but yeah old building old old building the old 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 building <laughs> so it's like you had to specify and then say that's the Holly, it's the chandler building in north hollywood that's it's funny man so i I always, I always bring this up. Like I always, whenever you guys are on, because I want to be an animator when I was younger, it just didn't turn out that way. I Me too. And then I forgot about it <laughs> when I went to college because they didn't have it, but I wanted to as a kid. I, this is going to be a fun conversation, man. I, <laughs> I really enjoyed when I can have talks like this, but uh, whenever, whenever you guys are on, I try to associate something with what you guys did and what, what I did. So that way I can understand it a little bit easier. So I was in the Navy for just a little while. And every, at every point when I was first getting in until I got out, right? Um, and I don't know why this story comes to mind when you were just telling me about the old, old building, old, old building. But so you get to boot camp and then you're like, you're excited, but you're nervous because you're supposed, the whole goal is to get out of boot camp and get to the fleet so you can do your job. But at every stage of you going somewhere, so you start out of boot camp, like, man, you don't have to worry about this. This isn't the real Navy. Wait till you get to the real Navy, right? And then you get to your first command. Everybody at my first command is like, nah, this isn't the real Navy, bro. Your next command wait till you get there. That's the real command. That's the real Navy. And then I got to my next command, heard that next command, heard that next command, heard that. So I did like seven plus years, seven and a half years, give or take. I don't know if I was in the real Navy. I don't know if I was in the fake <laughs> right. Navy. I don't yeah, know where never, I was at. You, you never made it. Yeah, you never I never, I never found it, man. Right. I deployed three times, never fucking found it though. So it's wild. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, man. So 
it, is it crazy with you going going back to you, man? Uh, going from building to building to building. So you're in your third Simpsons building now, give or take. Yeah. One or two. Third. One, two, yeah. third one. Yeah. So how much bigger has it gotten each time or is it getting more consolidated since you guys are all working at home now at this point, or a lot of you guys are working at home, excuse me. Bigger, like the amount of people you mean? Yeah. Bigger in staff and, and just bigger. Cause I can imagine we, how many people are, are working on the Simpsons. I know you probably can't give you an exact number but ballpark figure. How many would you say as far as storyboards, writers, producers, and all that stuff goes? Uh, well, that side's trickier for me. Our side would be like, I mean, any given show, like I'm dealing with, like per episode, mm -hmm. I'm dealing with, or any director is dealing with maybe tw 12 to 14 animators, maybe four background people, two timers. So you're dealing with, I, I, I don't know, like overall how many people we have, mm -hmm. including like production and stuff, but maybe 150. I don't know. I don't know what the number that's, is. That's still pretty big. I got to imagine when you first started, it was probably a lot less maybe. I mean, yeah, it was a lot less. And when we were on paper, it was a lot less. Um, and the thing that's changed building the building is the, is like, I was just talking to somebody about this today, how nice it, it's gotten nicer and nicer. Like our first building, we're on the first floor, you know, stains in the ceiling, kind of a dumpy place no like ch child child welfare services we shared a building with you know so it was like d-list hollywood whatever right but How nobody really came that? no it wasn't it was kind no. of like no it was kind of guerrilla style like that's all you knew like we only knew that but like i remember like very rarely would somebody come in there like i remember like ted danson came in once and i'm walking in the hallway and he just walks by and i'm like for some reason when i see famous people i just my brain thinks they know them because it's i just go hey like, like, oh yeah, I know that guy. I know I you. See him. Yeah, I saw you. In that you know, with Dave Foley on the on the elevator at the second building. Dave Foley from Kids in the Hall was doing a voice on another show, and he's just in the elevator. And I get in and I go, hey, hey, like talk to him. Like I said that, like I knew him. And he's like, oh, hey, and I go, I'm sorry. I go, I'm so used to your face on TV that I think I know you. I'm like mental. Um, but that building was like, yeah, just like nobody, people didn't really come in, and it was just you know, whatever. And then the second building, like they built the floor for us. So it was clean. It had like windows, <laughs> more windows. And then the third place, like floor to ceiling windows, it's in like an area where like, like a lot of um, record companies are in like iHeartRadio's there. And a lot of us felt like, I just said this to somebody today. I said, we felt like we were a bunch of poor kids that got adopted by rich people. Because all of a sudden we're like, this is too good for us. Like we're used to having like a dump. And then we got used to it. Like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> but at first we were like, this is too fancy. Like the movie where you go into like the, you're the poor kid that's got their like, you know, their, uh, their gym bag and they're, you know, they get brought into this, you know, beautiful rich house. Did you see, hold on a second. That's it's pretty crazy though that that you go like I said you you guys are upgrading right so you start out here you get here you yeah. get here uh, when you're first at the Simpsons do you remember your first day I asked Brad the same question ladies and gentlemen Brad Edelson go back and check out that episode it was a lot of fun uh, and he he recounted his his first day oh he um, said he worked on the Simpsons he never worked on the Simpsons that lion fucker <laughs> what what'd you call him again Tim? that what? lion fuck face oh that's so good. <laughs> he's gonna get a boner for this one um, <laughs> i do remember my first day yeah what was that i like? dressed too nice i dressed too nice i got there early and i had never worked in animation so i had i mean maybe i need a little bit of history before that so it's like i went to college for illustration mm -hmm. in boston i'm from new England. i'm from massachusetts um, wanted to work in animation as a kid, but just kind of forgot about it when I was in college because they didn't have it. Majored in children's book illustration. Worked for my city's sewer department for when when I like during the summer, you know, during breaks. And then when I got out of school, I was like, I'll keep working that. It's a good job. I'm outside a lot in the winter. It plows snow, making good money. I kind of got stuck doing that. Um, didn't really know like. The whole freelance thing with illustration it didn't really i didn't know how to do any of that stuff anyway met a girl date a girl who was in was was 
had gone to Emerson, was going to be working in film, wanted to move to LA and go to film. And she's like, why not move to LA? Like animation's like hot. Like maybe move to LA and see about that. I'm like, oh, okay. And I had never moved away. I never lived away from my home. And then, um, so she moved out first. And then I was like, well, I know how to paint and draw. So I'll do a background. I'll do a portfolio of backgrounds and then shop that around. And so I moved out six months after her and, um, and started shopping my portfolio around with my paintings and really didn't get, you know, I got some, actually got some input from a background painter that, that I really admired that was at Disney named Donald Towns, who was, he did a bunch of stuff for, for Disney um, in the nineties, you know, Beauty and the Beast and beautiful stuff. And he actually, I went to pick up my portfolio at a place that he was working at and he brought me back didn't know what he looked like, didn't, had never met him. And he actually spent a bunch of time with me, like giving me tips on stuff. And I just like came out and didn't get a job. but was just blown away that this guy that I admired took time with me. And my girlfriend, um, who's been my wife for over 25 years. Um, oh, yeah, she, you know, I came in and I was like kind of down, you know, thinking, you know, you know, I didn't get the job. And she goes, well, how'd it go? You were in there a long time. And I was like, oh, I didn't get the job, this and that. And, she, and, I, and I told her what happened. She goes, she's always had this ability she goes which is part of the reason why i i am directing probably in the simpsons at this point is she saw it in a different way she's like wow he spent that much time with you he must have thought that you had something going like mm -hmm. he wouldn't have spent any time with you if he if he didn't see something in your work that he thought yeah. was you know and i was like damn it that's that's a really that's a good way to look man. at it yeah yeah and she's always been there like pushing me like learn this learn this like you know, go, go some, you know, you have friends that know how to do this part, you know, go. So she's always been that, you know, that, that driving force to like, just kind of nudge me, which is good, but she was right about Donald Towns. Um, but yeah, my first day, you asked about the first day on the Simpsons. You, you, said, you, early. you said you dressed way too nice for it. You remember what I did. you Why well, I wore chinos, you know, in a polo <laughs> or whatever, or whatever. I was trying to look professional, but you know, everybody looks like, you know, they're all man babies. They're all dressing in you know, shirts with, you know, cartoons or whatever on it. Whatever. That's what first I wear. Day, that's right? what I wear every day. I've been dressing yeah, like first I was 16 day, right? for 16. Yeah, you're right. It's like if we worked at a bank or insurance, if they were a fucking soup, did you actually look, get to be 55 and look kind of young? I don't know. Yeah. Or Cargo shorts and t-shirts, man. Right, right. Exactly. So, um, so I, long story short, I, I, we, I knew somebody that knew somebody that worked on the show and they said, oh, they're looking for background people. Mm -hmm. I was working at Crate and Barrel. We were both working at Crate and Barrel, my wife and I. So she got me the test, you know, working the test, making all kinds of calls to the producer going, what's a field guide? Like all kinds of crap, like animation wise. I had no idea, right? They should have just been like, you know, fucking forget it. Like <laughs> click. <laughs> So my first day, like I get there early, nobody's there. I'm hanging outside, smoking, get, you know, get brought in or whatever. For, actually, the first person I ever met, first person I ever met was Mark Kirkland. No. Oh. Mark Kirkland was, he was at the, like the lunch, the breakfast truck that used to come there. And I was like, and I was like, oh, and I was, saw him, I was like, oh, you, you know, you work here, just trying to make it. It's like, yeah, I, you know, I work here. And it turns out he was, you know, a director. I didn't know. Um, but I remember the, one thing I, the one thing I remember most besides, you know, Kirkland being the first person to, I met was at the supply cabinet. They opened the supply cabinet and they're like, you need this, you need this. Do you need peg strips? I'm like, sure. Yeah. Like, I didn't know shit. Like, I didn't I know two. peg strips. Yeah. Peg strips, you know, for those who don't know, it's like, if you, you know, you want to move the drawing on paper, you know, you cut it and it's just a strip for the pegs to go on the animation disc. So you can put it a different way. And I had one director that used to call me Freddy Krueger because I would always rearrange stuff and move my paper and tape it up. And it was all fucked up and taped, you know, cause I would just slaughter it. Cause I would be like, oh, this shouldn't be like this or whatever. You remember which um, director? That was, that was Susie Dieter, actually. I do remember that. <laughs> Shout out to yeah. Susie. <laughs> yeah, good old Susie. Um, but uh, yeah, that was my first day. Um, Man. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. <laughs> like I didn't. Everything I know about animation, I learned in that show. I mean, I've been on it 27 years. I mean, I've been on it a long time in many different. 
I think the only director who's actually done every job, every art job on that show. Hey guys, it's your resident cartoon junkie Brandon Jones here asking you to have a listen to my Animation Destination podcast. It's an animation celebration podcast and it's full of all sorts of stuff about anime and cartoons and voice acting and all that sort of thing and just a really all-around celebration of anything animated. So come on by and check it out. We've got fan episodes of your favorite animes to your most obscure cartoons on Netflix that no one's ever heard of and just really love talking about it. You can subscribe to us on Spotify and iTunes and anywhere else you can get your podcasts from. So stop on by, subscribe, and stay tuned for the Animation Destination Podcast. Um, everything, like for a number of years. I did character layout, I did background, I did timing, I did assistant directing, I did directing. It's like I've done it all of the storyboarding, I've done it all the jobs. So I'm a firm believer in like, you can't direct people to, to do something unless you really know how to do it. Cameron's kind of like that, not comparing myself to Cameron, but that's why he's, people label him as a kind of a pain in the ass because you can't pull shit over on them because you know yeah. how to do their job. So, so, so nice little segue here. Uh, speaking of pulling stuff over on him so brad came on and i asked him if he had ever i've been fascinated over the last i want to say probably six to eight months um it started with the craig mccracken episode where i was just did you ever watch kid cosmic on netflix did you get a chance mm -hmm. to watch that mm -hmm. so it's a beautiful show it's it, imagine um the fucking infinity gauntlet so marvel avengers and shit like that they're trying to get the infinity stones but it's the infinity it's a ring so he's got all these different rings um mean something one's got flight one's got you grow big one you turn into goo and this kid in the middle of like Arizona or New Mexico uh, sees a meteorite crash and he's like, oh my God, I got to go see that. It's aliens. So he goes and gets all of these, these, these rings. And, he, and like I said, he becomes a superhero, Kid Cosmic. Um, and I, I'm watching this and then I, I was talking to Craig and I, I was like, dude, I'm nothing against the show, nothing against anything about the show. I was like, I was so fucking drawn to the backgrounds. It was just this, this interesting style. And I was like, I was just, I kept getting pulled out of the story and just looking at like, I would pause it. And I would look at things. I was like, oh, man, that's so cool that they have, I don't know, a fucking record player there. They have this, they have that, they have this. And getting to see over the last, like I said, last six to eight months, uh, there was a book that came out. It's like they drew what they wanted. And it was a Disney book. And it was like all the stuff that was hidden in backgrounds or put in yeah. backgrounds and stuff like that. And uh, I'm going to have to hit pause here for just a second. In just a second. Um, but I asked Brad what he snuck in. And then. We're going to come right back. I want you to think about if there was anything you got to sneak in because uh, right yeah. was it's getting ready to it's getting ready to drop. So I'm going to have to edit this part out. So I'm going to pause it real quick. So Brad tried to sneak a dick in the background, dick and balls in the background of a uh, was a claw machine. It made it all what the a, way. What a shock. What a shock. <laughs> what did you try to sneak in? Do you try to sneak in a cock and balls, too? Or did you go something? No, that's 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 yeah, that's Brad's ass and that stuff is brad's <laughs> forte no i i didn't try to sneak in stuff i got shit in there all the time because when, back when we were doing backgrounds you know you were you were like license plates for instance like you know your you know your wife's birthday or i would i would always put in the kennedy limousine gg300 was kennedy's limousine when he was assassinated i just threw that on a bunch um there was an episode that's dark <laughs> Yeah, there was an episode uh, where a parade goes through dangerous bum town and there was like a bunch of like a, an empty lot and it was a bunch of like an old car and a bunch of shit. And I had the Simpsons fridge in there, like with, with the like Lisa drawing on it, just shoved in the side. Um, the episode Bart the Fink, when Krusty fakes his death, there's there's Lisa and Bart go into... Um, the, the sea captain shot and they blow the they blow the balloon and it and it's not fully blown so he, they go like, we're looking for this guy it's supposed to be crusty and it's all fucked up looking crusty and he goes oh that's handsome Petey he dances for quarters and this weird guy comes out and he's he's got like a squeeze box because he looks like crusty but he's all fucked up anyway on that episode in that shop there's like a shot of the side of the um register and it says don't don't it's sea captain's shop so it says don't don't accept checks from these buccaneers and it it, it adjusts down to like crusties but there's a check from me for like a ship in a bottle and this check from my wife like i just put our names on it and just went really cool we, that stuff we don't really can't do anymore they don't you know 
especially license plates, we don't put anything in for license plate, but back in the day we would throw it in here and there. And also when, when Krusty fakes his death, like there's a, there's a, you know, his, his, the plane hits the mountain and there's debris everywhere. And we were throwing in kitchen sinks and faucets and all kinds of crap in the, you know, in the actual debris, just to, just to put stuff in, but unfortunately, you know, no, no penises in no. the debris at all. No wieners, huh? Yeah, looking back on it, maybe I should have done that. But do you feel satisfied in your career that you haven't put a wiener in the background, Tim? Absolutely. <laughs> I am the wiener. I am the wiener in the background, <laughs> pulling the strings. Oh, that's great, man. Oh, do you ever? Did you see the new Jackass movie, Jackass Four or Jackass Forever? No, I watched Jackass like the first few seasons, and then it got to me. It got kind of malicious. I didn't like it. Like I, <laughs> when they were playing more tricks on people, I didn't like it. I don't mind them doing crap to themselves. That's not really my humor but but the first few seasons were pretty pretty funny so in, in the latest one uh they had chris pontius they treated it like it's actually fitting because i was waiting the entire time to do this because uh godzilla right so imagine <clears throat> excuse me uh my voice is cracking my guy I my guy godzilla yeah i think yeah i think i just hit puberty there i'm more of a king kong guy myself but uh well um, i yeah, like see, godzilla. we can never be close we can never be close no i love king kong <laughs> Um, but, uh, so they take, um, and this all ties back in ladies and gentlemen, so I apologize. Um, they take Chris Pontius and they build a set like the Japan, Tokyo, the Tokyo where Godzilla is coming and crashing in for the first time. And Godzilla is Chris Pontius's wiener and nutsack. And they have him tied up as a marionette. They have the tip tied up as a marionette and it's just bulldozing through an entire city. And like I said, he's dressed up like, like uh, Godzilla. So, uh, you should at least check that one. It's, it's in the opening. It's the trailer. Uh, it was fantastic. It's the open. That was supposed to draw me in. That was supposed yeah. to draw me well, in. Well, I figured I Godzilla, we're talking wieners. We we had to pull Brad in here somehow. So we're talking yeah. wieners. Pull Brad's wieners. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, yeah, it's pretty good, man. They, they do uh, they do a lot of crazy shit, obviously. It's called Jackass for a reason, but it's uh, it's a pretty good <laughs> movie. It's a way to end it. A good way to end it. They bring in some new talent. They got some old talent in there. Um, but uh, shit, we got backgrounds, right? So what was it like when you see your name for the first time in a Simpsons episode? Mm. Oh yeah. That's exciting. That's yeah. Exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. I remember like when, yeah, totally exciting. If you could see it, I mean, you, you know, you tape it. Mm -hmm. We used to have a thing called like videotape. PCR. Yeah. I remember <laughs> back in the day. Um, yeah. That was exciting, but it went by so fast. You'd tape it right to watch it and uh, to see your name on it, which was cool. Um, and then later on, you know, when you direct your name moves to the front, but it's also like, where is it going to be? Where is it going to be? And I remember like, I changed my name on the credits to Timothy Bailey. Classy. So, my, we, well, that's my actual name, but I mean, I, I changed it because my mom was always complaining that she couldn't see it. So I'm like, well, I'll make my name like Steve Moore has Stephen Dean Moore. I have two middle names. If I put my full name in there, they'll have to use two you know, they wouldn't even fit on one screen. So I said, Timothy Bailey, so my mom could see it better. Okay. It's bigger on the screen. But uh, yeah, the first time you see it is pretty cool. It's really cool. You see it on TV. What episode was the first episode you saw your name in? The first episode I worked on was uh, Marge Be Not Proud in season seven, the Christmas episode where Bart steals the, uh, the video game from the mm -hmm. store. Um, and I remember I started in... Uh, June of 1995, um, last century, right? And um, <laughs> I was six, by the way. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> which is ironic, which is funny because I work with people now that like, like I work with a guy, I have a guy on my crew right now who is 27 and I was just talking to him one day and I went, oh, I just celebrated my 27th year in the show. And then I went, oh my God, I was 27 when I started. They should have like ripped a time vortex <laughs> or something. It didn't make me feel old. It was just like, that's just fucking weird. Yeah. Um, but I started in June, June 19th, 1995. And I remember uh, back then I smoked and I remember taking smoke breaks and being like, like you're drawing snow all day long because it's a Christmas episode and you go out to smoke and you're like, your mind's like, it's not Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like i mean we're living in la anyway having grown up in new england my whole life you know your first 
January that's 70 something degrees. I remember seeing home improvement on. I go, why the fuck is there snow on this episode? I'm like, and my wife's like, it's fucking February. I'm like, oh, right. Like other places have snow. Um, but yeah, Marge Be Not Proud was Steve Seymour's episode. And um, Tomazako was his assistant director. You know, Tomazako years later worked for me, timing for me on one of my shows. It's just funny, like like the hell of time, and Steve's still there. Um, but like how many people come and go. Like people, again, the show has been on so long that we've had people leave for a decade and come back. It's so insane. When I sit here and think about it, and this is not another way of me saying, hey, I'm young. <clears throat> but this, this, so, this show came out the same year I was born. Mm. And to see it still going, you don't see shit have the longevity that the Simpsons have had, right? No, and it's, it's There's like nothing. you, right. And you think like, you know, if it came out in 1960, right? It's now 78, it's 1990, 1992, mm -hmm. and it's still on. Like that's how long it's been on, Yeah, you know? And it's like, I started the seventh season and I remember like, you know, we'd have those, we get renewed for a couple of years and we had those beans going, oh, you know, we're not sure we haven't, you know, we haven't heard, you know, just make sure it's just unheard of. And we've had people, I'm starting to know people that are retiring from the show. And so it's insane. funny because one of my, one of my friends, uh, uh, another director, Matt Fawn, and we're a good friend of mine, we were talking and I said, how weird would this be? if we retire from our first job in animation. Like I said, and, I, and it's funny because like we describe it as like, if that happens, it's just like the guy who swam off the, the tail of the Titanic as it fucking went under. It's like, it was a good ride. Just fucking leave in the sunset. And I'm like, I, oh, I don't know. I don't know. But it's like, it's, it's see, yeah, how long it's been on and how like things in the show, like cell phones, right? Are just like, so and so picks up his stuff. It shit wasn't like even around when the show started. Like I had an episode where I did a I did a Halloween episode where I had a Stranger Things act, mm -hmm. and the note from Fox was uh, it was a, it was a section where Lisa's dressed like '80s and she picks up the phone in the kitchen, and the note was uh, make sure it's an '80s phone. I go, it is a fucking '80s phone. The show came out in '89. Like that, the design is like a the touch tone phone from the fucking 80s like it like oh make it rotary i'm like okay that's 70s but it's like it's funny that that's like making an 80s phone like it is an 80s phone like you didn't know what an 80s phone was come on god but i don't think they even i don't think they even <clears throat> thought about it that way like they just like i'll oh, make sure it's an 80s phone but they didn't think like well of course it's an 80s phone like we designed it and it was designed in the 80s you know like i but, said um, it's, it's yeah. so wild looking at this because like i said nothing nothing lasts as long as the simpsons hmm. I've seen marriages fall apart quicker than the yeah. Simpsons have. No, well, I mean, as long as the world changes, the show can go on because yeah. it's like the show's about us. The show's about the world. It's like mm -hmm. it, it changes, it responds, it deals with, you know, pop culture stuff. It deals with, I mean, I'm not super into a lot of pop culture stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that was real on the show, like Facebook. Like I remember Burns had a Facebook line. I was like, what the, what the fuck is Facebook? <laughs> I didn't know what that was. And it was like, it just stuff that just like in, that the writers come up with, that's like a pop culture thing or just something that's up and coming. And then we learn about it through the show, which is, it's just kind of funny. Is it crazy going back? And do you, do you go back and watch the older episodes often? No, not often. No. So, I can imagine something like so. You brought up a couple, a couple things. So, like obviously, Stranger Things was a, is still a phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. And then the first time somebody picks up a cell phone in the show, right. and then the first time Facebook, internet, all this other stuff. Well, not so much as the first time they picked up a cell phone, but the fact that they're regular things on the show. Yeah, and or like, and then when the show started, that technology didn't even exist. That's how long it's been on. Does it? You know, does it mess with not mess with your head in a bad way, but is it like? think about like oh shit man we were we were there when this started like a lot of times you can sit there and you can look at a point in time or an event that happens like i know exactly where i was and it's come up so many times these last fucking six to eight episodes but like i know exactly where i was 9 11 i know exactly where i was i was driving to the simpsons yeah i was driving to work on the simpsons when i heard that i was in i was literally in seventh grade i think it was sixth or seventh grade i don't I, I, 
fucking say i man i know where exactly where it was i know what class i was in i know who i was sitting behind i know what happened i know everything like i can i can the tension the, the tension was palpable just seeing all this stuff and where, where i lived at at the time was a huge puerto rican like population right so a lot of my friends were from new york right mm -hmm. so I'm seeing all of my friends getting checked out of school. I'm seeing them wheeling in the, 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 the TVs at the time. Um, and then the teachers are all crying. Like you see stuff, but you don't really have the wherewithal. You don't have the mental capacity to really download. <clears throat> God damn, getting all choked up. Uh, you don't have the mental capacity to download what's going on at fucking 12, 13 years old, you know? So just seeing all of this shit unfold, but I got to imagine you seeing maybe you haven't seen it in a long time but you see the first time like somebody uses a computer or the first time you're seeing the technology kind of catch up and the shows evolving with the technology i got to imagine going back and looking at it as the person that's worked on it it's got to be a head trip sometimes right i mean or is it just meh it's just a job man it's what we do um to a larger extent it's our job it's like and we're insulated by it but <laughs> by, by what it really is like, I remember we did that, uh, Simpsons does the Hollywood Bowl where they had the music played, you know, they, they had a orchestra there and they were doing a tribute to the Simpsons and, mm -hmm. and they had seats for us, a lot of us to go. And, um, you know, and people bought tickets too. So we're at the Hollywood Bowl and, you know, they're showing clips and people are going nuts. And, and I remember, I think it was Matt Fawn again, my friend Matt Fawn. And I turned, or maybe it was the day after, we were talking about it and I said, wasn't that weird? Because it was like, oh, right. This is a thing that people love. Like you work on it so long, you just like, it's something you love to do. Sometimes you hate doing it like any other job, right? But mm -hmm. you've done it, you worked on it so long that it becomes- Autopilot. You don't realize that it's like, if you work at a bank or you work at an insurance company, no one knows who the fuck you are. They're like, oh yeah, you work for Wells Fargo, yeah. But it's like, not like, oh, I love Wells Fargo. Like Wells Fargo is so great. Like, it's like people love it. And it's, and it's something that until you're out in that, you don't, mm -hmm. you forget about it. I mean, it's there in your mind, but you forget about it. When you see people like going nuts over it, you're like, oh, like, right. Like this is a, like we create something that people love, which is cool. Yeah, it's, it's very rare that, <clears throat> and it came up quite a few times with Brad, where we would talk, because I would ask him, like, dude, what does it feel like? Like, what does it feel like? I asked that, like, three Nothing times. Nothing against bankers, by the way. They do a great job, but it's like, it's just- a I've got some issues with some of these bankers out here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other story for a whole other time. <laughs> we'll do another podcast. 2008 Thanks. fucking crash. Bullshit. I had to join the military because oh, right. that shit. Anyways, I'm not, I'm not mad at all. I'm not jaded, assholes. No. Um, but, uh, no, but I talked about Brad, like, it's- because I kept, I kept asking, and I, and I felt bad when I went back and re-listened to that episode because I made it feel like, hey, man, you're not grateful. You're not grateful. And it's not like what I was saying. It was just like I kept bringing it up, but bring it up in a different way. And I was like, and I, and I had brought it up, and I was like, I think we all go through that, man. We're all doing something, whether we love it, whether we enjoy it, whether we don't like it. We're all doing something to an extent, right? And very rarely do you have people that enjoy the ride the entire time because you're so fucking busy. Your, your head is usually down and you're working, you're working, you're working, you're working. And you look up and 10 years have passed. You look back up 15 years have passed, 20, 25 with you. You just hit your 27th year, man. So you got to sit there and say like, fuck, dude, we did a lot of cool shit on the Simpsons. We made a lot of great episodes. We, we did a lot of cool shit. I don't mean to boil it down in just those two simple topics, but you guys did some really cool stuff is what I'm getting at. And then you start to, you, you forget that you like shit, dude, the process, the journey. That's what's fun. The friendships. That's what's fun. All of these memories that you probably haven't thought of, like some of these stories you've, you've probably told or you haven't told or you haven't thought about in a long time, they start to come flooding back. 27 years, it's a long fucking time to be anywhere, right? Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's, not, it's not for a lack of appreciation too. It's like, it's like I've said to like some people, like we were talking about The Illusion of Life, the book The Illusion of Life, mm -hmm. which we had, you know, a lot of us had growing up. And it's like, you know, I, I often make the joke, I'm like, you, you, you know, to newer people or other people, just, just if, if, depending on what comes up and they're working on, I'll say like, you probably had that book and you're like, yeah, I want to work in animation. I want to, you know, I want to, oh, uh, Pinocchio skipping down the road, this and that. I'm like, yeah, great. Here's Homer using a caulking gun. <laughs> Have fun. 
Like it's like that's the sexy part of animation, but it's Get like ultimate, nerd. yeah, ultimately it's ultimately you're like, yeah, that's not like those the sexy, like as much as I love like the 90s Disney stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Or like in this case, 89, like with Little Mermaid, which I loved, I saw in the theater. It's like, you know, you have part of your world, this beautiful sequence. And then the next, exactly the next sequence is the prince walking with a sheepdog on the beach that looks not that great. It's like, you know why? Because it's not the fucking sexy sequence. Everybody wants the part of your world sequence. They don't want that. <laughs> so when I work with people, I'm like, make it look like you had fun. Yeah. Because when I worked in, when I was in college for illustration, I tell a story to my crews all the time. I go, we had a, uh, a product illustration class and we had to do, I had to do a Windex bottle with pointillism, you know, with ink. And it was, you know, all the plastic sheen and all the lettering, it was just misery. And the teacher was like, it sucks, right? And I go, yeah, it sucks. He goes, make it look like it didn't fucking suck because you're gonna get jobs like that. Yeah. You have to draw a fucking Windex bottle, like it blows. Same with animation. It's like, you're gonna get a scene that's like, not like, I call it sexy. You're not gonna get something that's sexy, but find something in that scene that turns you on about it. I don't mean mm -hmm. sexually, I mean, artistically, like, yeah, you know, get into it, put some music on that, if that's your thing that gets you to kind of rock and, and, and fight the fight the words in your brain that tell you you're no good, because we all have them. Oh, boy, do we the, uh, the, uh, all the all those words, that, you know, your brain talking to you going, yeah, they're gonna find out you can't do this. Now, I've been there 27 years. And that fucking voice still comes up that imposter syndrome bullshit comes up. Where it's like you you're not they're gonna find out finally and you're gonna go fucking get just because you can't draw one thing and then the next thing you're drawing is something that you think is great yeah you know i've had that discussion with my wife and she goes you're just gonna she goes you're gonna balance that that are you shit or are you the shit you're gonna go back and forth constantly about that that imposter syndrome but anyway you know find it find something that makes you like that makes you happy about the scene and you can put your put character and personality into the scene and make it great because as soon as you don't as soon as you like it was drudgery i'll fucking know as soon as i look at it i'm like yeah you hated doing the scene dude that's some words to live by there's a lot of people like i said that listen to this they're animators there's probably some people listening to it right now they're drawing and fucking drawing a windex bottle right now and they're hating their life push through it find something good it's right. all and every right and whether you're a professional or you've been doing it for a, a, a long time that voice still comes up it doesn't matter when it, when it when it happens. It comes up. That voice of doubt will come up. That you're no good. You're in the wrong place. And yeah, everybody needs to know that everyone does that art artist wise. And you just gotta like right find you know music that makes you feel good about yourself. Like you're dancing inside, whatever it is, you know, makes you feel cool. And just yeah, push through it because it's gonna happen. And you just you can't let it get you down absolutely man thank you for sharing those words of wisdom there man mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen this is a this is some real shit that he's telling you and it, it just goes to show you man even if you love the job this is the dream you've been chasing for ever it's not always going to be rainbows and sunshine you're going to have shit days you're gonna have shit weeks you probably even have shit months and years i've been in at least the last decade shit decade um some good things have happened but for the most part man it's just perspective it's all about perception on how you take it into uh, so push through that Windex bottle. Yeah. And you're going to being being creative for a living, like being creative, like on a schedule, if you think about it, it's just the craziest, dumbest thing anybody mm -hmm. ever came up with. Like you need to wake up and be on yes. and you're not going to be on. You're going to have days where you can't fucking draw shit. And you're like, because your brain, your whatever it is, you know, whatever it is, your mojo for that time is just gone. You know, mm -hmm. and, and then the next day, all of a sudden you're good or whatever. It's just like, it, it's, it's hard to tap into it, but you learn as you go longer and longer that you, you don't learn how to fake it, but you learn how to push through it and, and, and try to like, try to get it out of your, your, your hands, your brain. Absolutely, man. I feel edibles or I find edibles help me considerably. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so we've got a few more things to talk about before we start to get to the fans questions. Um, I'd love to have you back on Tim. I hope you had fun with the exception of the two fucking breaks we've had to take on the 15 minutes starting late, man. Uh, peek behind the curtains, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd love to have you back on because 27 years is a very long time, like I said, to be doing anything. And I got to imagine after this phone call, or after this Zoom call, really, uh, that you're going to have probably some stories or some thoughts or some stuff you haven't really thought about 
you know, with the Simpsons, 27 years, like I said, a long time, uh, you know, might flood back in. So I'd love to have you back on uh, down the sure. road and we can, we can go a little bit more into detail. Um, but uh, we talked about the first time you saw your name in, in, uh, in the credits, man. Uh, did it feel any different seeing it from a storyboard artist to a director? Or was it the same kind of feeling? That's a good question. Um, storyboard director. Or anything else, right? Like character layout or your know, time. Yeah, and, and all of, in all of the jobs, does one because <clears throat> there's I've had so many people from character designers backgrounds. They've done everything, like yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. Does one outweigh the other? Does it all feel the same? Do you get any emotional, spiritual, you know, mental boost from one than the other? I guess is what I'm really getting at. I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying to think. I'm not sure if I do. I think that first time was really. I mean, that's seeing the, the name for the, the first time. time, yeah. And then later on, I don't think it, it's not that it, it has a, a similar impact, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not like, I think once I started directing, I mean, I kind of, I eased into those different things slowly over years. So it wasn't like, you know, it's it, it was kind of gradual, yeah. gradually going into these things. So yeah, I don't think, I don't think, yeah, I don't know if it had a different impact. I think it was pretty much the same. Well, that's cool, man. Um, because like I said, it, it everybody I've talked to, they say the same thing. First time I've received it, even if they've directed something, it's the first time because it's like it's like take, doing drugs for the first time, man. You're always chasing that first high, right? Um, so it's, I can imagine it's the same kind of concept because you guys are brought up so high, you're like, oh shit, I never thought I'd be here. Now I'm on the biggest cartoon, the biggest adult animated show of all time. My name is right there forever for everybody to see. It's there forever. Right. So it's, I can imagine that's a pretty cool feeling, right? It's funny that you said forever, because I do say that to my cruise room, like do a good job because this, this episode, we, we, this is the only time a, we get to work on this particular episode and then it'll always forever exist after. So if you do like, I remember my first episode that I directed this one scene that bugs the shit out of me and I wish I'd fixed it. And it was like, and it's just, it's just, there's some stuff that you like, you gotta like, you, there's always stuff you gotta live with, but it's mm -hmm. like this stuff where you're like, when I'm checking scenes to ship them, I'm like, sometimes I let it, I look at something, I go, yeah, that kind of bugs me. I'll see if it bugs me the next time I see it. And if it still bugs me, I'll fix it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want it to be one of those things that forever is like, ah, every time I see it, it, it bugs me. What's and that time one thing doesn't that bugs you though? That. I'm not going to tell you about it. No? <laughs> <laughs> what's, it rhyme, what's it rhyme with, Tim? What's it rhyme with? Maybe we can <laughs> oh, uh, I don't, the scene, what it rhymes with doesn't. No, it's just the way something's drawn that kind of was like, yeah, I don't like that. Uh, no worries, man. Um, so before we get to the fans' questions, there is a few that I like to ask beforehand. Mm. Uh, the first one gave you these two. Uh, your Mount Rushmore. Yeah, four plus one. Animators, illustrators, like I told you, musicians have come up before. But people, people's wives or husbands have come up as well as inspiration. So you can always throw in your lovely wife as well. Um, but uh, four plus one, inspirations for Tim Bailey. Mm. Definitely my wife would be on there. Okay. Um, because I wouldn't be I wouldn't be doing this, right? I'd probably still be cleaning sewers. She was the person that was like put that in my ear, going, Hey, what about this? Mm -hmm. Um and she's been there ever since nudging me here and there. Nice. Um that being said, I'm a big I'm really like a firm believer in giving back, especially to the young, you know, younger people, like just giving back and working with them because everything I've learned about that show because people stopped to show me something I wanted to learn or show me repeatedly if I couldn't understand it, you know? And it's like, I think that's really important to like, to give back to people and, and it's to see them like have that Eureka moment or get excited yeah. by something because they, you know, they, they, they get it. It's it clicks. Awesome. Yeah. So my wife and um, yeah, well, it's, I mean, artist wise, um, Hayao Miyazaki um, comes up as does Tezuka, another early, you know, uh, anime director, creator, Walt Kelly, um, the comic artist, Maurice Sendak, storybook, you know, stuff. All I'm earlier. so glad you brought him up. I'll, yeah, I'll, I didn't really, mean to apologize. I apologize no, for interrupting, but Maurice Sendak, I'm glad you brought him up. Please continue, though. Yeah, yeah. Maurice Sendak, um, Mercer Mayer, a lot of like earlier, like 70s, 60s, 70s uh, children's book illustrators um talk about inspiration it's funny musically i mean musically 
I love a lot of music and groups and stuff, but inspirational. I don't know about inspiration. Hmm. That's weird. Like big Beatles fan, British Invasion, but I love Rush. I love Mozart. I love Sinatra. I love Mel Torme. So I kind of like, I agree with Louis Armstrong when they asked him like, what kind of music you like? He's like, I like good music. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like um, yeah, but uh, I don't know if I filled that up. Did I fill up those heads? Oh yeah, Probably. yeah, you yeah. did. And I'm, I'm glad. Like I said, I'm glad. I want to circle back to Maurice Sendak for just a second. So uh, we have a 13 year old, and then we have a one year old, right? A uh, one year old's name is Cooper, and probably for like the last eight months. Um, so w- whenever we had the kid, like I would watch him. Wife would get in the shower. Wife would get out. I would get in the shower. So we always had somebody washing him until the baby went to sleep. Um, so. It started out for the first couple months where I was watching an episode of Samurai Jack every single night to rewatch the show to to just I just wanted to revisit it. Right. Mm-hmm. And that kind of led into like, oh, baby, you know, Cooper's getting a little bit more mobile. Um, so let me start reading him a book. So about four or five months old, I start reading him a book every single night. Um, and then he his mind his his like he just gravitated towards where the wild things are. Right. Mm-hmm. So one of his first words that he started learning other than dad, you know, mom, uh, but cause he can't say my oldest son's name, which is Hayden. He can't say Hayden. He just says, Hey, and he tries to say, Dzin, right. So he just calls him Bubba. So uh, the, the word that he's learned after that has been book, right? So anytime you walk by a book, 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 and he points, right? So for eight months now, every night we have read where the wild things are. I can recite this book. I was doing it with my wife. My wife's like, you're not even looking at the book. I was like, I don't have to. I was like, last night I read it to him three times before you got in here so I could get in the shower. So I've read this book so many times. And it's funny, this fucking Zoom call thing. So we got 10 minutes. So I'm going to wrap this up real quick and we'll try to hurry up. Um, but yeah, so that's, that is his book. And like I said, I'm so glad you brought up him, man. Ladies and gentlemen, read your kids where the wild things are. They'll love it. Um, AJ Ray too, uh, Curious George. AJ Ray stuff is also inspirational too, as well as you know all these amazing people I've worked with over the years that have just been like, I've worked with every single director on that show in every capacity. So it's like, you know, I worked with them all. So it's like they, they and I've learned from all of them. So it's been it's been great good journey. I've, I've tried reading different books to him, but he just he looks he keeps saying book and he points to, to the wild well, thing. Yeah, one. that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, it, it is. It really is, man. Um, the next one is two books that you would recommend every fan of animation should have, or every person that's in working in animation they should have on their shelves. What are two books you'd recommend? Um, I would say um, any of the storyboard uh, books from Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah, you could pick any two of those if you wanted to, but I mean, you should own all of them. But if you want to learn how to storyboard and learn how just to break down, not only storyboarding and and good filmmaking, but the mechanics of animation, like how things work, like Mm -hmm. we work digitally now, but we're still using the same mechanics as we did on paper. We're just compiling it digitally. Um, So to to see a Miyazaki movie and then look at his boards and see him working out the problems and how he figured out because you can see pans, you can see how he does all that stuff. Um, you know, Illusion of Life is a good one, as is Shot by Shot, the book that's a filmmaker's book that just teaches yeah. you, you know, filmmaking is a great is a great book. Um, but yeah, the Miyazaki ones, definitely. Yeah. Your uh, your your wife's cousin brought that one up to. He's like, he's going to talk Miyazaki and he's going to talk uh, Gaijin or not Gaijin, excuse yeah. me, because that's foreigner. Uh, the uh, he's like Godzilla for sure is going to kaiju. Come up there. Yeah. Kaiju. That was the word I was looking yeah. for. Thank gaijin. You. Yeah, Gaijin is foreigner. foreigner. Yeah. 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 Right. So um, but uh, yeah, I just showed my oldest son because he is balls deep into anime right now. Um, and he has been for the last couple of years, probably since the pandemic started, because Naruto hit in 2020 on Netflix. So that's all like mm-hmm. that's where it started. Um, so I just showed him Spirited Away for the first time. He had never seen it before. And I was like, you got to watch this. And I was like, after I was done, I was like, what do you think? He's like, it was good. I was like, this is great. He was like, yeah, I'm going to go watch Demon Slayer now, if that's cool. With right. You. Well, that's the thing. It's like, so you're getting like great storytelling, but his attention is you know he's going to sexy he's going yet. to fighting yep. and shit so it's like you know you you show him you know kiki's delivery service it's like oh it's a baby move and like, yeah. yeah you'll get this in about four to five years probably well the thing is it's like it's easy you know again on the page fighting and that kind of you know spaceships and that kind of shit mm-hmm. like it almost boards itself but like it's much it's much harder to board something that's quiet 
Yes. Because it's like you, you've got stuff that's going on that you need to rely on composition and acting versus like, as much as I like stuff like that, you know? Absolutely, man. Uh, I, I can't agree more. Um, perfect example is Genny Tartakovsky, man. Go watch, and go watch Samurai Jack and watch how little dialogue is in there and they make you focus. Mm-hmm. That show, that creator in specific, he's he's my Mount Rush. That's that guy's on my Mount Rush. He's number one always. Uh, Gendy is a phenomenal animator and a creator, and he is the master of silence. He makes you care for characters without using any dialogue whatsoever. Um, and that's that's like I said, it's a true master at their craft. Um, <clears throat> so the last one before we get to the fans' questions. Um, all right, and then the next one is this is how I got you on the show. Sean Cashman it was the animation recommendation. Uh, so he, he, he name dropped you and Mark Kirkland as the two people that I should reach out to and get you on the show. And here you guys are. Um, so who would you recommend? Anybody out there that you would say, hey, you would have a great time on this show? Anybody we should reach out to? It's something that I know that you should reach out to animation wise. Yeah. yeah, anybody you think would have a fun time on this show? Oh, fun time. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Well, my friend Matt Fonin might like it. He might, he's another director on the show. Okay. I'll write him down. And we'll reach Some out to things. him. Yeah, yeah we'll reach out to, to him. Of, trying to think of who else. Like, my mind's all of a sudden going blank. Uh, it usually happens with those three questions. I usually get yeah. one person on, on or not, I usually get at least one of my guests on one of those questions where they're like, ah, ah, ah. and it's usually the Mount Rushmore one. That's the one that usually I get everybody on because right. they're like, fuck, dude, this is my Mount Rushmore. Why can't I think of this person's name? And they start naming the topics or naming right. the cartoons they work on. I'm like, oh, you mean, you know, fuck face. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, that's like it. I wrote them down like an asshole because I was like, I knew I was going to forget. You know, I knew who these people were. Um, maybe Matt, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. Might have to think about that and send you another. Oh, that's perfectly fine. Well, I'll reach out to Matt. So thank you for that one, man. Like I said, I always like asking the guests we have on because you guys know the people more than better than I know them because you work with them, man. So uh, it's always fun. All right. So we're going to rotate into the fans' questions and we'll get to as many as possible. There was quite a few, some good. Really? Oh. Oh yeah. Reddit. Reddit blew up. Not and not blew up because it makes it sound like oh my god. It's all over the place, man. We're a yeah, small there's podcast. Three. There's three. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small podcast. There was some. Uh, ask, really... ask fuckface this question. I want to know where the. <laughs> so Cosmic Tom wants to know: Are you really? I'll talk to him. <laughs> no. <laughs> man, Cosmic Tom, man, what'd you do to old Tim over here? Mm-hmm. Is it the Tim Tom dilemma? Is that what it is? <laughs> Not even <it's> Cosmic. <laughs> I don't know why is he Cosmic. Uh, he said, "Are you really the head of the Quickie Mart?" What? I don't know, man. Tom wanted to know that, so I figured we'd ask that one. I think that's a guy named a poo. <laughs> well, there you go, Tom. I don't know what that means. Am I the head of the cookie bar? I don't know what that means. Who knows? Maybe he's on to something here. Or, I don't know, man. We'll get to that one. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. You heard about Pluto wants to know. Where's the Fife? Give me the Fife. Is that Mickey Rooney? So I'm assuming it was. So the he's picture. doing the Simpson. Yeah, right. He's doing the Fife, the Homer joke, and then yes, it's Mickey Rooney. Yeah. These are questions. <laughs> yeah, some of them are. Some of them are just. Uh, some of them are out there. Uh, <laughs> man, this name's fucked Here we up. Go. It's gonna be. <laughs> don't just say. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> asks. <laughs> Giffen G. I'm. I, some of these names are very difficult. G E F A N G N E. Which do you think is more important, hard work or stick to itiveness? Aren't they kind of the same thing? <laughs> um, Maybe. Yeah. Keep some of these, I've, you're dealing with a very stupid person. So I'm trying to. Um, some of these are probably deep cut quotes. Like I, I see a lot of that with the Simpsons fan base. A lot of people will. Oh, pick are they? Something. Yeah, sometimes like I like I try to stay away from questions like that. Like I told you, season two. Fucking yeah, so maybe that is 17. maybe that is one because it seems like we have the same thing. Uh, this one's really cool because this one you'd be able to answer since you uh, since you touch upon uh, since you do directly now. Um, Bwofel wants to know, which is evil Homer, uh, wants to know how much how much changes from the original idea slash script to the time it's finally to produce. So is there a lot of changes from the time you guys have a script in hand till it's being animated and produced and everything? Yep. Yeah. How much would you so. say is 
as far as the original script, if you had it out of a hundred percent, as far as, you know, capacity goes, oh. is it a lot, a little bit, you know, it depends on the script, but it can be, it can be quite high. Um, yeah. but you know, percentage wise, maybe 25, 20, 30%. I mean, there's been, there's been episodes where they've cut an entire act out and re really? rewritten it. Yeah. But I mean, we get, you know, by the time I go into layout from storyboard phase, I can get three rewrites. And then Jesus you Christ. Know, is that average? Like, is that a normal, normal type of thing? Or is that yeah, like, normal a is like, yeah, like two. And then when it comes back in color, which I have an episode that just is coming back in color for next season is um there'll be another rewrite off of that color screening so there's a there's usually three four sometimes five rewrites okay so that's that's about average and this is about a drop uh, i'm going to send you the next one real quick back up mm -hmm. i told you before we hit record i don't like to edit much i'm gonna have to edit the shit out of all of this stuff right here so i mean it's gonna have to take a couple seconds it's no directing you know anything like that not as professional my constant cursing is what the problem is ah that's like so i cook for a living so i like to use four letter words it's the salt and pepper of conversations <laughs> i like to say um so we we asked that one um and you said it was a, you said it was average about three rewrites. Now, what, with the with the rewrites, mm -hmm. is it generally just the script, or is the art kind of safe, or will you see stuff like that cut and redone considerably? Obviously, if a, if you know pictures not lining up or in a gag or something like that's not lining up the way you want it to, will you guys cut whole sections of art out as well? No, it's usually the art's cut just based on uh, the rewrite, based on the dialogue, uh, the the new script changing. Okay we're not really changing artwork for the sake of like i mean we might have notes for like design elements like backgrounds or character or that kind of you know we give them designs they might have notes based on that that we change but we're only going to change sections or scenes based on um a script change now i do have one question and you might not be able to answer it because it might get you into some trouble so we don't have to use names however i've heard horror stories and i've heard good stories of producers some people, when they get on, they want to have their name stamped on and say, hey, I did that or I made that happen. Um, whenever you're working on a show, are you guys assigned a producer for each episode? Like is a produce, different producer for each episode or do you guys have one for one season or however many you, you'll direct a season? Does that make any sense? Am I asking the right question the right way at least? Mm, well, I mean, producer on the animation side, you mean? or on the Yeah, like um, will you guys like so your boss, so if you're the director for an episode, you'll have a producer that's working with you and the studio, correct? The the admin side boss, of the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Crazy, crazy. So how many episodes will you direct a season? You, you particularly, do you know how many you're going to do this? I do three. Season? You do three. So will you guys have the same producer for each episode? Yeah, the same producer does all the all 22 episodes. Okay. Oh, so it's just one producer for the entire. Oh, yeah, gotcha. it's one producer for our the animation side. Okay, cool. Because I, I didn't know because I know you guys were broken up into teams as far as you know the directors and stuff like that. So I didn't know if it was three director or if it's twenty two episodes. So it's probably a little bit less than seven or a little bit more than seven. So I didn't know if there were seven different teams for each three episode blocks. If that makes sense. So I didn't know if there was oh, production wise. No, production wise, it's the same team, but we have like one producer, the main producer, mm -hmm. we have other, other producers that under him that do different jobs, but they okay. all work on all the episodes. Okay. So I didn't know if there was like, like I said, if you ever get, if you're getting a new producer for each episode, I didn't know if there was one, you're like, fuck. I get, like I said, I wouldn't ask you for names, but I didn't know. Yeah. If you'd... No, I don't have that anyway, but we don't, we, it's all, it's all the same. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, where are we at? Oh, uh, Fruskin T62 wants to know, ask him where he likes to see hefty women dance. <laughs> I'm assuming that's another deep cuts in the episode. I guess. I'm also <laughs> sick of answering that question, quite frankly. But Really? Has that one come up before? <laughs> I don't know. No, I've never oh. heard of it. <laughs> Dude, you had me going there for a second. I was like, shit. Well, again, the show has got, yeah, right. You could easily pull lines from the show. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a line from the show. <laughs> Um, this one's probably going to be along the same line. Uh, faint, uh, King of King of Fangamar, 13, wants to know. <laughs> 13, that means there were 12 people trying <laughs> to get that name. <laughs> he stuck around for it. He saw mm -hmm. it through. Mm -hmm. Or she, excuse me, because it uh, looks like a female avatar. So 
apologize. Uh, would you wear a nacho hat? And would it be nacho hat if it was a nacho hat? That second part I added, I was just trying to be funny. But would you wear a nacho hat? How do we hang up on this? Do I? Is there a way to hang up on this? Oh, leave. I can just hit leave, right? <laughs> End meeting for all. It closes down the entire thing. <laughs> okay, forever and ever. Um, this one, this one will be fun. Uh, okay. I usually don't ask those questions, but I just figured it'd be fun. You might have something fun to say. <laughs> yeah, um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was fun. M Liz twenty one underscore seven wants to know what was your favorite scene. What's been your favorite scene that you've done uh, a storyboard for? Does one stick out or two stick out to you? Oh, that is a good. That is a good question. And I promise you, the rest of these questions are going to be fantastic. Not oh, that those okay. ones were bad. Some of those ones were really right. funny. I just wanted to see what you'd do. But the the next ones are really good. Yeah, a certain scene. I'm trying to think of a certain scene like the. the I was thinking like I boarded on both Halloween shows that I directed, Treehouse of Horror. I did the Coraline. Um, we did it in CG, but I did I I storyboarded the Coraline sequence, Coralisa sequence, and Lisa going through the tunnel with the cat. I remember it was a lot of fun f- trying to figure that out. And the Stranger Things stuff was really good too. Like yeah. doing I boarded that sequence as well. Um Lisa blowing the the as eleven blowing the bus apart and the creatures coming out all that kind of stuff was I don't nothing really I can't remember it doesn't come to mind like an actual scene but mm-hmm. but like acts that I boarded um, those are fun again sexy acts right it's Stranger Things it's you know it's Coraline so it's already got and the Coraline one actually uh, the company that did Coraline sent down a Coraline. Uh, book and one of the figures, like one of the dolls that they used in the in the movie to show us, like you know how it looked and the, the articulation and everything. Yeah, 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 the ball and socket. You know, I was amazed at how small she was. She was quite small, but that was cool to see that. Did they send you the art of Coraline book? I think it was the art of. Yeah, they sent a book down for us to look at, and they sent that. Somebody came down with the doll with the different models, you know, that clicked on, which was cool. Um, and they, I think, the Exorcist. Act. I didn't board on that one. I think Mark Kirkland boarded on that one. Um, yeah, they start to all run together. But those two episodes, I remember having a lot of fun boarding on it. As the as with the uh, the Da Vinci show from when Lisa was thought herself as self as da, da Vinci. That was a few years ago. I boarded on that one, and that was fun because we didn't have any designs ready, which is typical. So like you're you're doing a and with that show is a all the kids were dressed in you know Renaissance costumes. So we had to like, as you're storyboarding it, you got to come up with something. So you're kind of like designing it as you go. Yeah. So like you don't, you know, already you don't have enough time to board it in two weeks and you got to like design like the backgrounds and the characters. But it's, ultimately when you look back on it, it's fun to be able to, you know, do all that stuff. I got to imagine you're stretching a muscle you don't usually get to stretch and you're really pushing the limits on what you can conceptualize. So I got to imagine that's pretty fucking cool too. You're like, fuck dude, what were they wearing in the Renaissance? I don't know, probably balloony looking shit. And you guys yeah, came up with something. Right. Really cool. we, we have reference a lot of times where they, you know, especially Fox will send us reference of what they have in mind. Mm-hmm. And we can like, we can kind of riff off of that. So you have like, you know, some old paintings or whatever. And you're like, oh yeah, I'll take this guy's hat and this guy's baggy pants or whatever and you know you figure it out Make but she's like, clock's ticking clock's ticking you gotta get it done absolutely man um oh this one kind of cut off their name so i think it's the simpson index uh how often are you confused with the australian weatherman who is also named tim bailey oh that's um, funny that, that's funny because i do know that guy's name and I, the only reason why i know that is you know the few times i've actually put my name in to look for something and that guy comes up. up and and i think they hate him or something they're like they think he's a jerk or something i'm like oh that must be me i'm like oh no that's the weather man from australia but yeah I've, I've never nobody's ever confused me for him but that's a funny question because i i do know about that the other in fact it was funny when i was in art school in the late 80s in boston there was another art school in 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 uh, boston with another tim bailey going at the same time going to that art school i never met him or anything but i was just like how weird is that it's just weird <laughs> You should go and check out books under his name, just to fuck with. That's him. my name. <laughs> I'd be fucking with myself. It's that time warp thing we were talking about, where that oh, twenty seven right, right. meets twenty seven. The right. time when Ali's supposed yeah. to real. He also tagged the other, the uh, Daily Bailey Live. Uh, how often are you confused with the Simpsons director? I just thought that one was a fun one. 
Um, oh, this one's good. Uh, Video James NZ wants to know. Uh, he's from New Zealand. Um, from script to storyboard, he's got a two-parter here, I think. Uh, he's like, from script to storyboard, how much creative freedom do you have when coming up with visual gags? And would you say visual gags are some of the most fun you can have as a storyboard artist? On The Simpsons, it's, it's scripted. So it's scripted from start to finish. So everything that's written in there, you have to do. Um, unlike a lot of shows, like there's no going back and forth. It's like whatever they write from that title page, that blank page, you know, we have to come up with, at least it's the first version. Um, so it's not like a show like some Nickelodeon shows or Cartoon Network shows, other kids shows where, you know, they have an outline and the storyboard guys get to make up stuff. They get to do gags and do a, you know, a pitch of what they want to do we have a solid script that we have to uh, adhere by mm -hmm. uh, gags and all um that being said i mean you're there's most of the people i've heard that have come on the show to storyboard find it really difficult to be that i don't know if it's the, because it's heavily scripted or what but they have a difficult time with it sometimes um I like it because you're dealing primarily with shots. You're dealing with composition, shots, acting. You're dealing with all that stuff and trying to, you know, come up with ways of doing what they wrote um, in visually interesting ways, but mm -hmm. also like making sure that the comedy plays, making sure that like you really understand what they're writing mm -hmm. comedically. Because sometimes they write things that as written, maybe it doesn't work so well or yeah. it's it's difficult because they're they have words in the script to explain what we're seeing and we're doing it as a visual and we don't have those words because when you read it your brain knows what you're seeing because it's telling you as you read the words but visually you don't have that luxury so sometimes we have to tweak it a little bit to get the idea of what they want you know to play it in a visual form and we show it to them sometimes and they're like yeah it's great like they, they went for the ride with us. So a lot of times it's challenging that way where it's like, you know, how, how do you get this to work visually? Mm -hmm. Like you have to do it the way they, they wrote it and it's fun, but it's, it's definitely challenging. Oh, I got to imagine, man. Uh, and then he finishes this one with the Simpsons and Sonic the Hedgehog define the nineties for me. Uh, smiley face. Um, oh, he's actually got a couple here. Uh, what is your process for storyboarding? Do you always start drawing out the scenes in order or do you work backwards? How do you do That's it? That's another great question. That's another great question. For me, I work from start to finish. I don't skip. I don't go out of order. I go mm -hmm. from start to finish from one to whatever. Um, when I read the script, I'm just visualize. I, you know, when you read something, you just picture it in your head. Like that's what I draw. Like I picture it. You know, I spent years laying on a couch as a kid watching Dick Van Dyke and Leave it to Beaver and all these old shows or old monster movies. And, you know, people were saying, oh, you're wasting your life away with this and that. But I was doing research mm -hmm. like in your mind when you read situational comedy stuff. Your brain goes, yeah, I know what they're doing. I've seen that before. I can't tell you which Mary Tyler Moore it was or whatever, but I've seen that. I know what that is. I know how to do yeah. that. Um. I do know people that are like, they're like, yeah, I don't know what to do for the sequence and they work out of order. But I typically work, yeah, I work all the time start to finish, like from the beginning of my sequence all the way to the end. Have you always been like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't um, thumbnail, I don't thumbnail like ahead of time. I don't, I just kind of like read it and picture it in my brain and just draw it kind of that way. Yeah. So they see it in my brain. It makes sense. Um, Jesse wants to know, uh, will Sherry and Terry get their episode? <laughs> I don't know. There's so many <laughs> spinoff possibilities, right? The Mo Show. Like, the you know, could it could it happen? Sure. They could do spinoff shows. You know, they, there's, there's always been, like, talks. Like, well, maybe they'll do a spinoff, but never, like, you know. Never put some weight behind it. What would it be? If they, if they did put weight behind it, you know, they didn't tell us. Um, well... Jesse, keep watching. You might, uh, you might, might be, the, might the, happen. The teenage adventures of Sherry and Terry. Who knows? <laughs> Could happen. Um, so we got a couple more here. Um, oh, fuck, I can't zoom. I need glasses. I think. 
Um, okay, so this one's a two-parter. Uh, well, it's, it's the same question, but it's different. Do you have a favorite episode um, that you storyboarded and you directed? So do you, have a, uh, do you have a favorite episode that you storyboarded and do you have a favorite episode that you directed? And is it possibly the same episode? That is a good question. Um, there's an episode I really liked that I did last season, but I can't remember if I storyboarded on it or not. Um, it's called Lisa's Belly, where Lisa gains weight. Lisa mm -hmm. and Bart both gain weight because they are um, on prednisone. Ooh, um, I had to take that as a kid. Yeah. And you do gain and, weight. Yeah. I'm actually like Googling to see if I worked on it. Um, I can't, remember if, I can't remember if I if I bordered on it. I think I story bordered on it. Break out that That's VCR terrible. that you were talking about and see if That's your name's terrible. on it. Oh my god, I can't remember if I board. I usually board because of the schedule. I usually storyboard at least one show a season. Mm -hmm. um, and I always board on my shows because I'm like, if I'm gonna work hard on something, I want to work hard on my own stuff, like my own episode. Um, but. Yeah, like famous. I mean, the Halloween shows are hard to beat as far as like, you know, favorites. Oh, yeah. But I, yeah, like I like the 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 Coraline one. The Coraline one, I storyboarded that act, the second act. And I also storyboarded the cold opening, the sweets thereafter, the one with the Simpsons as candy. And that was CG as well. But the storyboarding of it was was lots of fun. Um so I had those two, the, the Treehouse of Horror, but for the life of me, I can't remember if I, if I worked on Lisa's belly. I mean, I directed it, but I can't remember if I, if I storyboarded on it. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, you let us know in the comments if uh, yeah, would it be, an, tell, would it be, did you go back to Timothy Bailey or is, this, is it Tim Bailey now in the credits? No, it's Timothy. <laughs> Still Timothy? Okay, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ice Cream Hero wants to know, what is your favorite Homer injury? You know, one or two that stick out well i mean him falling down springfield gorge is always funny just because the animation <laughs> is so crazy you think uh, they took that from do you remember you remember seeing the movie oh, what was it um black sheep or, i always get him and tommy boy mixed up it's black sheep i think yes black sheep uh chris farley david spade um gary Busey. so chris farley is trying to get internet signal on his on his cell phone this back on cell phones um and he no, it's fucking Tommy Boy. So he's trying to get the cell reception and he's at the top of a mountain. I've actually seen Tommy Boy, yeah. Yeah, so he falls down the mountain or he falls down the hill and he's trying, he grabs onto the little tree. I don't know why. I think it's because I saw I saw Tommy Boy before. I saw that episode of The Simpsons where Bart, you know, he saves Bart from, from skateboarding down and he falls down the gorge. Um, but do you think that's where Tommy Boy got that scene from? Because I believe The Simpsons, that episode was out before Tommy Boy. Yeah, it was. Uh, maybe. Maybe yeah. that would make sense. I mean, heavy set guy falling down a hill is hard to beat. It really is, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the, and the, yeah, Homer's injuries is funny because it's been so many, but it's just like, you know, and the Homer lines too, like just lines that just, you just, the one where he, the, the, the one that my wife and I always laugh at, and we keep thinking about just, I know this wasn't the question, but Homer lines is that one where Lisa's, I think this is when Homer's mom comes back for the first time and she's singing the song, you know, he comes in and she's singing the song with uh, Homer's mom. You know, how many roads must a man go down before he becomes a man or whatever. And Homer walks in right as they, they do that. And he goes, I think he says six, he goes six. And they're like, and Lisa says, dad, dad, yeah, that's a rhetorical question. And he goes, rhetorical, eh? seven or he goes the reverse seven to six like he doesn't know and she goes do you even know what rhetorical means he goes do i know what rhetorical means it was just hysterical it's like he, he gives a rhetorical question back. <laughs> it's just funny oh understand. man uh last one here and uh this one i feel like it'd be a really good one to wrap up on hmm. so you got to put yourself in a world where you've got somebody coming from let's say a different planet right they've never seen the simpsons before Never once, they don't know Homer, they don't know Bart, they don't know Krusty, they don't know anything about this fantastic show that we've talked about for the last hour, hour and a half. If you gave them one episode that you would think oh. that they would get hooked on just by watching this show, what episode would you recommend? 
That's hard. I mean, 700 something episodes. I mean, Bart the Daredevil, that one where, where Homer falls down the Springfield Gorge, that one's pretty good. Brad gave um, me Flaming Moe's. Yeah, Flaming Moe's. I always like asking they, this question, so. They start to go together. I mean, the thing for me is like, it's hard to like sometimes remember, like there's so many of them. It's hard for me to sometimes focus on any of my episodes would be good now. Um, <laughs> every single one that says Tim Bailey or Timothy Bailey, Timothy, yeah. those are the one that you want on. Yeah, no, I think I just did some of the early ones are just like, I mean, there's some great current episodes, but I mean, a lot of times you think of those, those early episodes. Um, yeah, Flaming Mose is good. Yeah, it's hard that even if the Christmas special, the first one's good, it's I, I did they kind of run. They kind of run together for me. It's hard for me to like think of one. Think of like one. It's kind of like when people say like, "What's your favorite Beatles song?" I'm like, you can't do that. Like, because they did everything. Yeah. So it's like, how do you? It's like, give me a genre. Maybe that would be a little bit easier. But it's like, or people that say they hate the Beatles. I'm like, you can't hate the Beatles. They did everything. <laughs> it's like you gotta. There's gotta be something that like rings true. But, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be real honest with you. I've tried so many times. I've tried Stone Cold Sober and I've tried Stoned. I've just learned that there's things that they're they're for you and they're not for you. Maybe I just lack perspective or maybe I just lack uh life, I guess. I don't know. I just like I've got some songs that I like from them, but it's just like I've tried every album. It's just I just don't know, man. It's just not for me. God. Between that and King Kong, man, we've just drawn a line. <laughs> we can't we can never be close. The uh I mean it's it, yeah that's tough that's tough i well, mean give it's me, one give thing me an you album say, that you think give me an album that you think like i should go back and listen to because like i said i'm always i've all i'm always up for trying things again like i said i just think the last time i tried to listen to them like i said i'll be 33 in a couple weeks so the last time i listened to them i was probably like 21 22 so it's been some time and i've went mm -hmm. through some shit since then so maybe i just need to go back smoke a joint put it on and listen to it so what album would you say i should check out well i mean if you're going to smoke a joint i would have to recommend maybe others that depends it's like that might influence you more yeah um you know i don't smoke i don't smoke joints but i'm just saying like if you're going to smoke a joint maybe sergeant pepper might be better yeah you know um abbey road is probably going to be one of the best you know the early stuff is great but it's going to be more poppy rubber mm -hmm. uh rubber souls fantastic but i think Sergeant Pepper is probably the one if you're gonna like be a little bit trippy on that would probably be the one to like it's like listening to Dark Side of the Moon like if you yeah. don't listen to Dark Side of the Moon you know I remember you know as a teenager putting a speaker at the foot of my bed and one behind my head and shutting every light off and just listen to Dark Side of the Moon like a loser teen and it's fucking amazing because it's mixed so crazy the stereo and it just like and i wasn't on anything i was just listening to it you think i'd be like oh and i was you know tricking. high on life no. bro yeah it was just fucking cool I'm like just listen to it but yeah those two i would definitely abbey road it's got some more some more rock stuff in it and it's just in sergeant pepper but i'll often time when if you hear people that don't aren't into it they're like but i love the rolling stones like stones are more my thing like that's more you know the rock versus maybe the pop See, I'll be real honest when it comes to, and I don't even want to say they're from the same era. I mean, maybe they are, they're all gone now, unfortunately. Um, I've gotten more into Rush as I've gotten older. Like I enjoyed Rush. Uh, like growing up, I grew up, you know, late nineties is kind of like 95, 96 is where I re really remember starting to listen to music and hear music, mm -hmm. you know? So I was a really big nineties R and B and hip hop guy. I love the alt era, the grunge era. Foo Fighters, Sublime, I love Nirvana, Alice in Chains, um, and then hip hop in the early 2000s. I like a lot of the, uh, I love Miles Davis, man. Um, I love putting on the Spotify stations on funk and classic, uh, funk and disco. You know, so I like, I like a, an eclectic, you know, a, just a fucking wide variety. It's just like the band, like the Beatles, nothing against them. I think it's just me, probably more me than it is um, any anything else, but it's just, I've, I've tried at so many junctions of my life to like listen to them because people bring them up all the time. And I was like, fuck, dude, why am I just not getting Because like I said, I think it's me. I was like, why am I not getting this? Do hey, I, I'm do that I, way with, I'm that way with Neil Young or, yeah, or Dylan. I can't get, in, like, I can't I can't get into him or Tom Dylan. Dylan. Yeah. Just the, just the voice. I can't get past the voice. Rush was the first concert I ever saw. 
1983, Grace Under Pressure. Uh, he, Neil, Neil Peart was still doing the YYZ solo. It was like fucking amazing. Like first concert I ever saw, lasers and shit. And I was terrified to go because I thought it was going to be so loud. Like it was going to, what is it going to do to my ears? Like I never been, you know, I'm 16 or, um, yeah, amazing band. Amazing. And I've grown to like re-love Rush because you just find out that they're not only like brilliant musicians, but they're also, well, they're Canadian. They're also just really sweet, nice guys which just makes it easier to like what really like them. Absolutely. What's your favorite Rush song? Oh, man. Uh, oh, that's a tough one. Limelight, maybe. <sighs> that's so good. Yeah, Limelight. But I also love, oh, I can't remember the name of the song. Uh, oh, Xanadu, that one I like. I, um, the early stuff. It's the, I'm having the same blank. It's um, He's talking about... Um, fucking shapeshifter um there's that cygnus x5 order <laughs> i forget the well yeah he's talking about like we all need a break to disconnect and he's like you want to be a shapeshifter um fuck man. Oh, you mean limelight or is it another song because limelight's is... totally neil Peart not yeah. wanting to uh be in the limelight like he, he was not that was not his thing vital signs vital signs, vital signs. that's my yeah. favorite song that and uh limelight those are my two favorite songs yes. vital signs i don't know what it is it might be the weed and tim if i'm being completely honest with you <clears throat> might be the weed however i'm gonna go listen to it at least six times when i go out here and burn one i burnt one before like as soon as i'm fucking popped an edible on the way up here i'm rushing to get up here so we could talk um rushing. So I'm gonna, you're rushing to get up rushing to get up wow. here man see you what i did there Jeez. some say they couldn't be done ladies and gentlemen but i fucking crushed it um but uh yeah so like i'll put that one on and vital signs will hit and then like each time i listen to it like i said i don't know if it's the weed probably the weed every time i listen to it, i'm like i'm picking something out i've never been one of those people when it comes to music i enjoy it but i'm much i i enjoy podcasts a hell of a lot more than i do music because it, like music gives you three minute bursts of just i'm just gonna veg out or i'm gonna get through power through whatever i'm getting through for most people they could just listen to it and listen to it and listen to it. I, I can't i get burnt out like if i hear a song so many times it doesn't have the same uh what's the word um hmm. impact I, I guess impact, but it doesn't, it doesn't do the same thing. Like, so if you're lifting, right. When I was in high right, school, right. I used to lift a lot, run a lot, do squats a lot. I would listen to like Metallica, something like, get me real angry. And the more times I listened to it, it would have a less of effect. It'd have a less of a pump up effect to me. So it's the same thing. If I listen to it too much, I kind of get burned out of it. Like most people do with things, but it's just like, ah, oh, fuck dude. Now I got to find something else. Cause I don't have the same pleasure I had before I come back to it 10 years later, but vital signs is funny. Cause I'll listen to that one. And it'll play. And then I'm like, did I hear that? And then I'll play it again. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I heard that. And then I'm hearing something else. They were so far ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful, ba amazing band. It's just like, mm -hmm. I really wish I could go back in time and see them live. I'm, I'm happy you got to see them live, but I wish I could go back and see them live because it's just probably would have blown my fucking mind at such a young age, seeing them just bring the house down. Like you did. Yeah. And they were, you were, yeah. And if you listen to like exit stage left, it's like, that's what they sounded like live. They sounded great. It's like, they were just like a three, I mean, a three piece power trio. It's like, they didn't have any backup people. They were just them. Yes. And they sound like a whole bunch of people playing. It's, it's amazing. It really amazing. is, man. Uh, gone, but never forgotten, man. Them and queen, two of my favorite bands yeah, of all time. Great. <sighs> man. Great, 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 man. Well, like I said, Tim, this has been a lot of fun, man. I really appreciate you being so flexible and working out with me here. You're like a, I know you're not Canadian, you're from Boston. Uh, so you, you, you reminded me of a Canadian of how nice and how kind and how like accepting you were tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I can be, I guess. <laughs> sure. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. I've had a lot of fun. If uh, fans want to come and say, hey, man, Tim, I love I love seeing your name up on the credits and Tim and Timothy. I thought Timothy was a little bit better than Tim. However, I like what you do, man. Where can they come and find you on the old social media to say, hey, Tim, I like what you do. I hit the microphone there. Well, I mean, I have my Instagram, my Instagram uh, account. They can go in there if they want. You can see my artwork. I, I post some old sketches from simpsons every once in a while i post my own stuff just my artwork and uh they can check that out see if they dig it um seeing the old simpsons stuff a lot of people appreciate like and it's like all of us who've been on there forever have boxes and boxes of xeroxes and stuff from back in the day of scenes that got cut or scenes that didn't get cut or just 
people like seeing the drawings before mm -hmm. it was colored and that kind of stuff. And I post, I post that stuff on there. Beautiful, man. And like I said, ladies and gentlemen, you can go and click the link and it'll go straight over to Tim's page and follow, subscribe and everything else you can do to uh, really follow Tim on this journey, man. Like I said, Tim, this has been a lot of fun. I really had a blast. I can't wait to do this again. Uh, he's been Tim. I've been Julian. This has been the What's in My Head podcast, and this has been another piece of your childhood. Good night.